Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us. Chandler, over to you. All right, panelists, may we have your cameras on, please? Awesome. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's webinar on the very important topic of navigating cyber frontiers in government contracting to ensure a more secure government. I am Chandler Moore with Leadership Connect, and I'm excited to introduce you to our esteemed panelists contributing to today's conversation. We have Mr. David Antonio Green, Senior Vice President of Global Strategic Partnerships at Hitachi Cyber. We have Ms. Maureen Huck, Senior Manager in Cybersecurity and Technology Consulting, joining us from Ernst & Young. And finally, we have Mr. Jordan Burris, Vice President and Head of Public Sector Strategy at SoCure. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Quick reminder for everyone on the line, we will have a Q&A session towards the end of today's call, so please use the chat to enter any questions you may have. So without further ado, let's get into our first question. This first question will be open to all panelists. And the question is, what are some of the trends or current trends in government contracting that are driving the need for enhanced cybersecurity measures? Can we start with you, David? Uh, hi, Chandler, and thank you so much for having me here. And, and good afternoon to my uh, fellow panelists and also to the viewing audience. Um, I think the number one trend that for me in my patch that I'm seeing is the fact that government contracting has moved away from being just normal paper based and it's it's now very digital. More and more governments and government agencies are leveraging uh, portals. So there's that um, I would say business to business to business type interaction that's taken place. And even from a connectivity perspective, there is that connectivity that we're seeing between um, trusted third parties that gives rise for the need for greater um, cybersecurity measures, because it's just a matter of time. One third party could become that active vector for a threat actor to gain access to a government network. Awesome. Maureen, would you like to contribute? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Maureen Huck. Um... Thanks, Chandler, for the opportunity for uh, participating in the panel today. Welcome, listeners. Um, I'd say, you know, in my 27-year career in um, in government contracting, specifically in cybersecurity, I've never really seen as many recent executive orders and OMB memos as I have in the last four years. It's been a it's been a flood of. Uh, I mean, uh, for those of you who have been in cybersecurity and in um, you know, federal uh, or in uh, U.S. government contracting, you've seen HSPD-12 initiatives and PKI and things like that in the last uh, uh, 20 years. But in the last four, we've just seen this influx of executive orders that are, uh, you know, very targeted at cybersecurity uh, initiatives like zero trust cybersecurity, improving the nation's critical infrastructure and cybersecurity measures for critical infrastructure. Uh, now we're seeing a lot of uh, executive orders followed by followed up by the usual OMB memos to enforce those uh, executive visions for artificial intelligence and the risks uh, in artificial intelligence. So I'd say, um, you know, in the last uh, 10 years or so in uh, at least U.S. government contracting and probably true, I'm sure David and Jordan can uh, uh, can reassert that, can assert that for international uh, organizations and entities as well. Um, there's been a lot of concentration on cybersecurity in um, in protecting government and in government um, visions for um, improving cybersecurity. Awesome, Jordan. Yeah, anything absolutely. to contribute? Absolutely, and thank you, Chandler, for having me today. You know, I think generally, you know, from my standpoint, and you know, to 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 Mahreen's point, uh, I actually used to work on the teams. Uh, associated with creating some of these executive orders and these OMB memoranda. So instead of focusing, I guess, broadly on the the what is happening, right? Because yes, there's increases in cybersecurity, there's better looks at supply chain, et cetera. Uh, you know, I want to take a moment to look at the why, like why is all this happening almost in some cases? And, and really when it comes to government contracting, there's been this, this recognition that the, you know, a lot of the direction, a lot of the guidance, a lot of the mandates have been placed on agencies in particular and kind of left out the missing piece in understanding and really recognizing that 
you know, vendors or the, the industry broadly played a role in helping to secure the infrastructure. And in some cases, there was, if you will, a black box uh, to the government in terms of what was happening uh, with those services and products, which, you know, um, drastically altered, if you will, the security posture of the organizations that they were serving. And so so generally, I would say that the, the biggest trend, the biggest focus and change is making sure that there's accountability all the way to industry as well. Uh, uh, to better adopt those uh, security practices that may be needed to, to safeguard information systems and confirm uh, that they're able to better support agency missions overall. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question is for you, Maureen. Can you discuss some of the unique challenges that government agencies face when it comes to zero trust in the contracting space? Yeah, sure. Um... You know, zero trust um, has been a somewhat of a buzzword in industry for a while, you know, going back quite a few years. And it wasn't until the executive order um, uh, came out in 2021 um, to sort of stress and spell out, uh, you know, zero trust uh, requirements and be a little bit more prescriptive, followed up by that OMB memo uh, M2209 the next year that we really saw zero trust gain some momentum in, in the government. I mean, certainly the OMB memo required uh, US federal civilian agencies to submit their plans for zero trust uh, implementation. Um, and, and that was the first time we really saw a lot of this uh, push around zero trust. And it is, you, you will talk to every CISO in the US government um, and across, and they'll tell you it's an unfunded mandate. That's been the, the biggest challenge of zero trust uh, so far in, in our government and public sector space here is agencies, you know, having to respond to the executive order and OMB memo and the NIST guidances have had to scramble to revise their budgets and plan future budgets um, around zero trust implementation. And the challenge they faced immediately is that a, a plethora of vendors came to them with, uh, you know, our, here's our product, that's the silver bullet, and here's our product, and, and everybody um, does their, you know, appropriate pitches, uh, talking about how their products meet zero trust requirements. So government uh, agencies get uh, overwhelmed, so to speak, and don't know where to start. And they also, in my experience, um, in the process, lose awareness of their existing IT investments that uh, will get them part of the way uh, for zero trust. You know, a lot of agencies, federal civil agencies, certainly started down the road of multi-factor authentication even before these executive orders around and mm -hmm. OMB memos around zero trust came. Um, and they just picked up steam and continued the momentum around their existing IT investments, uh, all the while being faced with, you know, uh, a plethora of new products and new acronyms around it, uh, zero trust. So sorting through the noise, planning for budgets, uh, getting the funding uh, to do any new implementations, and certainly there are new implementations that will be required in, in zero trust strategy. Um, for example, getting rid of uh, eventually phasing out the VPN that allows static access and uh, lateral movement in the networks, which is quite vulnerable to attacks. All of that kind of requires, um, does require new investment and um, and therefore funding. So. I think uh, funding is the biggest challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorting through the noise has been the other challenge. Got it. Thank you. David, what are some of the best practices for safeguarding sensitive data in government contracts, especially in light of increased digitization? So that's that's an interesting question. Now, when I say this, I'm probably going to date myself, but I'm still... <laughs> Um, I still, I'm still a firm believer in the tried and true model of the, the three-legged stool, people, process, and technology. So we tend to, to factor everything that we do as a cybersecurity firm um, with the conversations that we have with our customers around, around that. Um, the first thing that I would start with in addressing that would be, uh, from a safeguard perspective, would be with the people. Nothing beats continuous training and awareness um, we've heard it said before that people are your weakest link. I disagree with that. People are your first line of defense and can be your greatest strength if you put them to the right use. So the more you train, the more you train, the more you train, the more you train, the better people get at it. There must be a reason why the, the U.S. track team does so well, because they keep practicing over and over and over and over again. And then they, you know, they come along and they whip the Jamaicans at, at track and field. 
Um, when you get over into the, the process side of things, now we're looking at how regularly are you conducting your audits and, and how are you um, structuring your, your internal governance around um, one of the cybersecurity frameworks that are out there. And there's so many that could be utilized. Okay. Obviously, CMMC and, and FedRAMP are some that come to mind very quickly, but then there's the standard ones like NIST and SIS, and it goes on from there. And then coming back to something that Maureen said around the zero trust architecture, now we look at the technology. And in order for you to get that three-legged stool to, to sit properly, you got to ensure that all three are interlocked and in step with each other. So what does my architecture look like today? Um, what tools am I using? Do I have shadow tools that I'm not aware of? And uh, a best practice approach around the use of multi-factor authentication and applying the right role-based access controls. So you, it's not a free-for-all where anyone and everyone can just access this digitized information that I have lying around. Um, you know, with more and more data breaches taking place, and in many instances, and some people forget, just because you're not a private institution interacting with a consumer or a citizen doesn't mean that as a government agency, I'm not holding PII or PHI. And this is something that has to be protected. So from a privacy perspective, what am I doing where that's concerned? And that then brings in the big question of incident response. Do I have an incident response approach or process that has been defined? Has it been tested? Have I sat down and taken the team through what do you do if something goes wrong, et cetera? So these are all pieces that fit together from a best practice perspective. And obviously, we can't all get it right, but you've got to start somewhere and you've got to keep at it continuously so that it improves over time. And the last piece of this from a best practice perspective that I like to focus on is that whole concept of measurement and monitoring. Um, there's that old management saying, you can't manage what you don't measure. Um, mm -hmm. So how am I actually paying attention to the environment today? Do I know how many vulnerabilities that I have in the environment? That's something that falls flat on its face many times. And vulnerabilities, not only at the application level, but also at the infrastructure level. How long is the vulnerability or how long has a vulnerability remained in the environment? I've seen time and time again, as from an audit perspective, vulnerabilities are there 30, 60, 90, 120 days, and you're thinking, good grief, what are you doing? The sooner you get to it, the faster you reduce the risk that's associated with it. So all of this comes back into best practice. And I know many persons will cry and say, listen, this all sounds good and well. I have limited budgets, I have limited time, and I have limited resources. And there's no way that I can get through an eight hour day and attend to everything that's coming down the pipe. Yeah. In some instances, and we appreciate this, there are agencies where you know, there's one person or only two persons and they have to handle IT operations, application management, and the list goes on and on. But this is the final piece that I want to um, drive forward. It's called prioritization. Unless and until you understand what your crown jewels are and you understand the priorities that are associated with them, you won't be in a position where you can say, okay, this is high critical, I need to deal with this first. This is low critical, I'll get to it in a reasonable amount of time. But if you're not in a framework of operating that way, then you'll be, you know, no doubt chasing your tail. So that for me would be some of the best strategies that I could come up with to safeguard um, government contract data today. Awesome. Thank you for sharing those best practices. Jordan, how important is collaboration between industry leaders, government experts, and cybersecurity professionals in creating a more secure environment for government contracts? Well, you know, there's a saying, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, right? Like that. that is uh, generally the way we need to be thinking about uh, technology collaboration um, and what's what's needed for government in particular. Now, I firmly believe in having sat on both sides, right? That the government must lead in certain spaces, especially when it comes to understanding its mission, understanding um, where there are gaps in particular, right? But I believe firmly that uh, with that, 
industry has to be at the table uh, working with them, not just industry, also academia, also, you know, working with members of the public, et cetera. It's because you can build effectively what is a better product, a better offering uh, overall. When, when it comes to looking at what's happening on the other side of the, the spectrum, right? If you're thinking about nation states, if you're thinking about criminal organizations, et cetera, they're not thinking about, you know, devising their attacks in a manner that's, you know, siloed. They're looking at how do we actually apply this at scale? How do we share with each other in order to do better in this space? So it's incumbent on, you know, both sectors really to be collaborating uh, broadly to understand how do you, you know, promote a collective defense. It also means on the industry side, we have to do better uh, in terms of how we are presenting uh, what we are, are bringing to the table, right? It's not always about selling, it's about solving the problem. Um, yeah. that is that is required you know one of the areas I, I get to work in today is identity uh verification and fraud prevention right and the number one thing i sit down with any uh, government leader is to try to basically demystify and better understand kind of what led us to where we currently are today and right and how do we potentially want to try to approach it both from a policy lens from you know regulatory lens if that applies from technology limitations that may exist whether it's a, their you know current legacy systems um, or, or even, you know, trends that are evolving with, you know, new advancements, et cetera. But in having that really candid conversation, then you start to uh, get insight into what needs to change, what needs to evolve, et cetera, right? So when it comes to, um, you know, collaboration, uh, in, in, uh, in particular, specifically as it relates to, to government and contracts, uh, it's important to, to have that two-way dialogue, uh, to, be, to be at the table, finding ways to contribute, add value, finding ways to further the mission, uh, ultimately, and, and then confirming that, you know, we're, we're better able to solve the problems that the, the agency uh, mission owners are seeing on a daily basis. Awesome. I couldn't agree more. It's not always about selling. It's about providing a solution. Thank you. I appreciate that. Before we move on to our next question, I just want to remind everyone that if you have a question, please enter it into the chat as our Q&A session will take place after this next round of questions. All right, back to you, Maureen. What role do you feel AI and machine learning play in enhancing cybersecurity defenses? Ooh, that uh, that buzzword AI that everybody's been talking <laughs> about, huh? So we yes. can't get through a cybersecurity conversation without, or any conversation technology without <laughs> talking about AI because it's so disruptive. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I've talked to AI leaders in industry and in my own uh, firm and. Uh, they describe AI as both the solution and the problem, right? Um, for um, uh, technology in general being disruptive as a as a disruptive te uh, technology enabler, but also for cybersecurity. I mean, we've got customers in uh, U.S. agencies asking us, "Well, how can you know give me some AI tools that will improve my SOC operations, um, that mm -hmm. will improve uh, you know penetration testing and and vulnerability scanning and things like that." And certainly there will be AI powered tools that are coming in the market, coming on the market soon, uh, are already in testing uh, phases and, and, and beta phases right now, uh, will be in minimum viable product uh, offerings pretty soon this summer even, uh, or earlier perhaps. Um, that will start to uh, enable faster, better, more efficient SOC operations, uh, security operations center capabilities like SOC analysts running reports uh, it takes, um, you know, a, a mountain of information for a SOC analyst to get through to compile and, and produce their reports and AI power tools are going to certainly help that. Um, and at the same time, the leaning into AI is scaring uh, all our customers, right? In, in U.S. government contracting, uh, we're seeing customers or U.S. government space, I should say, we're, we're seeing customers express a lot of concern about the risks in AI, and that opens up a whole vector of discussions around risk management and what you should be doing to manage the risks in AI. Um, you know, everything from, oh, do you have a, um, you know, a model or large uh, language uh, model bill of materials uh, to track the supply chain uh, of the AI models that you're going to be implementing uh, or proving out? Do you have uh, an awareness of the inventory of your AI assets. I mean, there are conversations in technology that have been ongoing for many years, like risk management frameworks and supply chain, cyber supply chain risk management. And none of that has gone away. If anything, they've become more important now with AI 
And then there's the problem of the unique attacks that are net new with AI technologies. We're talking about prompt injection. We're talking about possible model, model AI model replication. Uh, we're talking about, you know, obviously uh, toxicity and biases inherent in um, the data that the data sets that AI models will learn on. So all of those become, um, you know, uh, they all have a cybersecurity angle. Uh, there is no CISO in any organization who won't tell you that they are not concerned about the cyber risks of AI. Um, and there's no CISO in any organization who won't tell you they're also excited about the power of AI to help them. So um, it's it's uh, fast evolving. You got to keep up with it. You got to manage the risks and have awareness of those risks in the very beginning of such a disruptive technology, the bell curve is we're at the trough, right? We haven't right, uh, reached the peak yet. And uh, in that uh, in that part of the curve, uh, you learn and get awareness of your risks as much as you can, because governance is everything in the early part of that bell curve for technology adoption. Absolutely. Awesome. David, what are the most critical recent changes in cybersecurity regulations that businesses should be aware of? Huh. Um, that um, cybersecurity is becoming business that could put you in jail if, if you're not careful. Um, I started my career in banking and um, again, dating myself, when I started my career, we were right on the heels of um, the year 2000. So everyone was scared about Y2K and, you know, would the world continue with systems crash, et cetera. When we came out of that unscathed and we continued on, I remember the financial regulator sat down with all of the banks and said, listen, we have to step our game up from a, a readiness perspective. And anyone found to not be in compliance, there was an actual tangible fine that would have been levied not only on the banks, but also on the bank's executives, which is why they started say banking is dangerous business. And I've, I've lived long enough to see where from a cybersecurity perspective, we're starting to see all of those regulations find their way over into the cybersecurity world. Um, one doesn't need to look very far on the publicly listed side or on the pronouncements coming out of the SEC with the four-day reporting requirement, um, the disclosures, there's you know a cybersecurity breach, et cetera. And even from a, for those um, providers around critical infrastructure, um, if I'm not mistaken, there is a 72-hour um, reporting requirement, et cetera. But to tie it back into this particular conversation around government contracting, um, there are about three or four that stand out from a regulatory perspective that we ought to be aware of. Um, the first one is around the safeguarding of covered contractor information. So there's the federal acquisition regulations requirement. This is aligned to the NIST SB 800 framework. And there are around 15 or so basic safeguards that an, an organization or an entity has to go through just to make certain that they're properly dealing with federal contract information or even unclassified or um, controlled unclassified information, as they call it. Um, the other one I, I'd spoken of um, in an earlier segment was around CMMC, which is more room for the Department of Defense. And then there's FedRAMP, which is the Federal Risk and Authorization Management Program. And this now is anything related to cloud and cloud-related services that a government agency is leveraging. So if you think about it, if I'm doing contracting and I'm probably hosting my uh, contract portal in, in a cloud, cloud environment, it has to be FedRAMP certified. Um, there is ITAR, which is the International Traffic in Arms Regulations. This obviously is more geared towards defense and military, but that's going to restrict and control how you're exporting the related technologies around that. Um, again, it ties back in. So at, at the end of the day, all of these regulations that are out there, um, it's, sometimes it feels a little bit onerous, but it's, it's, it's necessary. Um, I'm looking at this from two sides of the coin. On the side of the private sector, um, there, there, there are safeguards that are in place because obviously you need to protect systems, especially on the financial side. And what comes to mind right now, for example, would be Doro, which for many persons, it's something that's more specific to the European Union. And one would wonder, why would that have an implication for us in the US? 
but then any financial institution in the U.S. that's doing business with institutions in Europe, then they're going to have to comply with this. And DOR, for those of you who don't know, that's the Digital Operational Resiliency Act. And in short, what it really is saying is this is an act that's put in place to ensure that should something go wrong, you have your act together so you can get back up quickly and continue the business in a secure fashion. And what these things aren't bad. I think these are these regulations, as onerous as they are, they're actually good because it forces us as professionals, it forces us as institutions to up our game. And only good can come from something like that. A bit of a pain, but still it's something that would help us to mature. For sure. Thank you so much. Jordan, what would you say are the most concerning emergency cybersecurity threats that you foresee in the near future? That's always a great question. And perhaps I'd build on what Maureen was talking about. The mm -hmm. current buzzword of the day is AI. Maybe we talk about yep. that, or maybe I just go further and we talk about kind of the, the lack of clarity that may exist in some of the regulations. For me, I would... Uh, in reality, I would say it's all the above. I would say you can throw another buzzwords like quantum. That's going to be the next cool thing that everyone's probably talking about at some point here soon. Um, uh, honestly, it's the pace of change. Uh, so when you really want to look at like what is the biggest threat, everything is getting faster and the need to stay ahead of it is becoming more and more important. Specifically when we're talking about security and kind of how we're needing to operate, uh, it's long been this thought, this process that you can almost... Uh, in some cases, you know, build something, maybe secure it later. There's been pushes to do secure by design, et cetera. Even that in this day and age isn't necessarily good enough because a lot of um, implementations that, that are done, unfortunately, uh, mm -hmm. don't actually account for the need to keep pace with the emerging threat. And so um, for me, I would say the biggest, the biggest, you know, emerging cybersecurity trend or, 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 or area where we need to explore is the, the need to automate as much as possible, uh, to move as quickly as possible when it comes to either remediating issues or, or staying ahead of what we need to, to be doing. And then being able to embrace change uh, ultimately and what we need to do from like our defenses and how the technologies are being deployed and how we're servicing uh, agencies in particular. Because uh, again, if you're looking at what's happening at scale. Zero days are happening uh, more frequently. These novel attacks uh, uh, that are taking place uh, are, are getting harder to discern. And even with the best you know, machine learning tools that are out there or those that are being built and potentially deployed, eventually they're gonna become obsolete in, in terms of what you're able to do at scale uh, in particular. So it's a really about understanding how can you move to a posture um, where you're not just always trying to um, kind of play from behind and you know just implement compliance for compliance sake instead of how can you take one where you're um, more actively uh, defending uh, what would be your your infrastructure your data uh, in particular and able to stay ahead and, and effectively recover right because it's that's ultimately what we're going to um, have to do and again it may sound somewhat draconian but just it's because of just the, the pace of change and, and how we're operating today Awesome. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We have now reached the question and answer portion of today's webinar. For the sake of time, we may not get to each question, but not to worry. Um, we will send out an email to answer the remaining questions after the call. So let me pull up the chat here. All right. So our first question is, how do government contractors ensure compliance with government regulations and standards while bidding for and ex I'm sorry, for while bidding for and executing government contracts? Would someone like to take that? So, so I'll give a I'll give a perspective, and then of course to answer it over to my colleagues. I think the, the reality is, is that every contractor that's out there needs to assess where they are today in terms of maturity. Uh, and effectively try to align it to what may need to be accomplished, in particular as it relates to government cybersecurity. I would love to say that their security uh, is always uh, easy to implement. That's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of requirements. And in some cases, we should think about those requirements as being the floor and not necessarily the ceiling as to where you can go uh, in particular. But with that being said, um, every, every company, every contractor that's working needs to, again, understand where they are 
uh, in, in terms of that, and then really make the decision about whether or not they want to invest upfront uh, for potential payoff in particular, and then try to align opportunities and conversations associated with where they are uh, in terms of security performance, uh, ultimately. Uh, it's the best way to move okay. forward uh, pragmatically. Okay. Anyone else with anything to add before I move on? Uh, I'll just add that, um, you know, a lot of these cybersecurity contracts now issued by the government spell spell out the requirements, right? And mm -hmm. uh, there are things that will give you a leg up when you're doing government, when you're bidding or, or ex when you're bidding for government contracts, you know, being uh, CMMI certified and um, mm -hmm. uh, being compliant with ISO standards. Those are not cybersecurity related, but they give you a leg up uh, when you're certainly bidding on government contracts. Uh, the cybersecurity regulation and standards, uh, if you're implement, if you're providing a hosted service, it should be fed ramped, it should have be compliant with NIST controls. Uh, that is something important to, to bear in mind. So you got to read the requirements of the contract and um, just make sure that if there are cybersecurity requirements, you can speak to them, um, such as NIST controls and, uh, and fed ramp, uh, like David brought up. Awesome. Thank you. The next question says, how do extenuating cybersecurity policies and executive orders impact a small business's ability to win government contracts? Uh, I'll take a first shot at that. So uh, it just opens up the aperture. Like I said, you know, at the start of my comments, there's the, the, the pace at which we're now seeing cybersecurity policies evolving and executive orders coming out has opened up the aperture and the appetite for uh, any business uh, to come and be able to answer these new requirements. Uh, small businesses have to, uh, are, are in some cases struggling to find the opening. Traditionally, you would think of cybersecurity functions uh, in government contracts as uh, being best performed by large uh, organizations that have the scale to put you know, hundreds of people or dozens of people on the ground immediately upon award. Small businesses don't have that. They always have the ability mm -hmm. to go and team with a large business and provide a niche capability. The, the, the flip of that situation is now happening. What we've seen in recent uh, uh, times uh, is that uh, a lot of government, US government agencies have small business set aside requirements of, or goals rather. For example, the DHS, Department of Homeland Security is issuing 40% or meeting something like 40% of its new procurements as small business set aside. I mean, that is, uh, and maybe I got that metric slightly wrong, but roughly. Um, and that is huge because the appetite for uh, small businesses to win um, and uh, is, is there. They can uh, bid as prime and be backed up by a large business for the capabilities or the manpower they may not have to deploy. Uh, but if they can concentrate on a niche in cybersecurity, um, you know, uh, zero trust uh, architecture, uh, if they can concentrate on cyber managed services as a niche, uh, something like that, uh, they will uh, be successful. Awesome. All right, our next question is specifically for Jordan. It says, how, was, how has your experience working within the federal government shifted your approach and perspective in the world of government contracting? That is a, it's a wonderful question. I would say as a, as a boomerang back to industry, right? So I started in industry, went into government for a period of time and came back out. What I would say is I've had, I personally have a greater appreciation for the complexity associated with operating uh, at scale uh, for, for uh, the federal government, right? And uh, effectively mm -hmm. what must be done to contribute to the mission. I think there's one of the things that, you know, needs to be thought of, especially as uh, industry is approaching uh, the government is, is, uh, much to the point I raised earlier, is how we're presenting ourselves uh, or how we're presenting the solutions and approaches that are being applied um, and, and really trying to come from a perspective of solving the problems that they're seeing, whether it be today or one that may be on the horizon. Government's open to hearing um, all these items. What they're not necessarily open to is hearing the marketing slick sheet. Uh, and so um, being more of a trusted partner and advisor is, is really the the main thing that I've taken away from my time with government. Uh, and that's a helpful awesome. the, the whole conversation for it. Awesome. The next question says, where are the common pitfalls and failures of security that exist between government and industry? And what steps can be taken to prevent these? Um, I, I, you know, I, I'll take a first stab at that. Um, 
the the gap between uh, government and industry is um, the increase in the number of offerings from industry, right? If you're a vendor to the government, um, if you're on that side, um, you, you're quickly evolving your offerings. You're quickly developing new modules of your software and uh, and uh, new uh, offerings for your services. Um, and the problem is that the government is uh, not as quick on the uptake as the private sector is, right? The private sector, uh, CIOs and CISOs are responsible for uh, and accountable for certain uh, cost saving metrics, right? The, the saving uh, in the cost of operations uh, and, and saving in the cost of their existing IT investments. That's what drives uh, their job functions and they're reportable for that, and they will be quick to adopt technologies that help them get there. Um, and also, of course, be compliant with uh, the new regulations across the European Union and, and privacy uh, regulations, etc. much as David brought up earlier. Um, government is has a different set of compliance requirements. They're compl they have to be compliant with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, federal regulations and things like that. But, um, and they have more limited budgets, I would say, than the private sector firms. So they're not as quick on the uptake. Uh, that doesn't mean that the two sides don't come together. They come together quite often, obviously. Um, and uh, it's just um, educating um, government customers is a, uh, on the newest product offerings in industry is, is the battle. It, it is constant. Uh, the pace, like I said, of, of the industry offerings are so much uh, that it can overwhelm uh, anyone. Uh, so there is a constant uh, uh, pitch and, and socialization campaign that needs to happen between industry and government. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, before, Next question. Go ahead. Let's go ahead, David. Add something to what Marine would have said. Now, what's what's funny, and we're talking about contracting here. Bear in mind that what anything that a government does or a government agency is going to do, it has to go through some form of public procurement because it's public funds and it has to be accounted for. Unlike um, private sector where things can be done very quickly on the dime, et cetera. I think one of the things that um, CIOs and CISOs at the government level need to stress on and drive is that the same metrics by which the private sector is being judged when they answer to their executive management teams or their boards. You know, what's my mean time to failure, my mean time to detect, and it goes on and on and on. Those metrics still apply as well at the government level. So if you're looking for some kind of intersection as to perhaps how government could step up, it's to treat this like how you would treat business. Yes, we understand there is public procurement involved and the wheels may turn a little slowly, but you, the message has to be driven that this can have long lasting impact at the end of the day if the metrics aren't followed. Awesome, thank you. The next question says, how do you best manage awareness and involvement of AI features inserted into existing vendor products to ensure it meets our internal security requirements? So I, I think it's a couple of things. Uh, one, it's better understanding the kind of the full stack and how um, there's interdependent system risk or how solutions have been deployed with any solution. You know, there's many vendor solutions today, even those that are in the federal marketplace in particular, where they're actually embedded a number of different offerings, all of which may be using AI in some way, shape or form. But there's no visibility into what's going on. And I think for me, what that plays into kind of the bigger picture is that we need to have just greater transparency related to what is being done, how models are being developed, how they're being um, uh, produced and making that available at the uh, at the request of the government in particular. Now, I guess uh, having lived some of this, right, one of the things that we have to do as a company that leverages machine learning uh, and, and, and AI broadly for delivering our services is we we do this by default, right? We we produce this because we know that it is incumbent on us to do this from the private sector side. Uh, of the world, right? But bringing and replicating that type of process within government is something that still needs to be built on uh, in particular, right? So it's, you know, again, getting the visibility and then making sure that with that strong governance, you're able to share what is happening broadly with, with the government in a more transparent manner. Awesome. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll, I'll just echo a, a thought uh, that I expressed earlier, you know, um, everybody knows software bill of materials, right? The ability to trace your uh, software supply chain. Um, 
none of that is yet accounting for um, AI software, right, or AI models. And certainly, um, there are unique. There's a uniqueness to AI as a software that may not fit the current software bill of materials structure. Um, so you may have to evolve uh, the S bomb, the software bill of materials that's used so widely in in U.S. government um, uh, uh, supply chains. Uh, into a model bill of materials or a AI bill of materials to sort of help you trace the lineage of that AI model development that you're about to adopt in the government organization. Do you know where the model was developed and all the components of it, where they came from? I mean, you know, we're certainly seeing a lot of attention now to uh, foreign production of components of software, uh, right? Um, and and a lot of sensitivity around, around that. Um, uh, but uh, but you know despite all of that, uh, how much awareness do we have of the supply chain in in AI, and that needs to be built and governed. Thank you. Next question says, how have your organizations adapted to NIST 2.0 framework unveiled earlier this year? Oh, go ahead, Jordan. I think you unmuted before I did. <laughs> No, I, so for me, I was going to say, like um, framework roulette, uh, there are just many ways in which you have to apply uh, the the different overlays, right? And again, it, NIST is just but one of the different frameworks that, you know, private companies are uh, expected to comply with, especially depending on what you're operating, whether you're operating within the U.S., serving government agencies, or you're operating internationally, because there's different ones uh, that apply in particular. I think for us, it's uh, just generally speaking, right? It's it's the mapping that takes place to understand where we are as a business, how it aligns to what is uh, being required or mandated through the through the framework, seeing where there you know where there are notably gaps and making a risk assessment decision uh, on our side uh, if if need be, and then moving that forward transparently with our our, our clients. It, it's a similar thing for us as well. We are a, a managed service, managed security services provider. So obviously we have SOCs as well. And in, in addition to complying with SOC 2 type 2, it's similar to, to Jordan. It's the same thing for us. Um, sat down with the framework, looked it over, and quickly started to make the adjustments where it needed. And of course, there is some degree of overlap between what SOC 2 type 2 might be asking for, et cetera. So we just adjust the suit. Awesome. Anything from you, Maureen? No, uh, nothing to add to what uh, Jordan and David already mentioned, um, okay. other than to say it was a great question. <laughs> it awesome. just goes to show we always have to keep, um, you know, adapting to uh, the newer frameworks. There's, it's not just NIST, you know, DHS, uh, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, um, also has frameworks, uh, TIC, uh, and uh, the trusted internet connection and things like that. So yeah, uh, we're always continually adapting. Awesome. We have one more question from our Q&A session. How does innovation play a role in the world of government cybersecurity? Um, that that's a that's a really cool question, and and Ivy, thank you so much for asking it. Um, it's it's provoking a lot of thought, at least for me. I'm I'm starting to do the same thing for my fellow panelists. Now we never know of government doing innovation. <laughs> Two words seem to tend to go in in opposite directions of each other, but there's a huge opportunity there, and I think the opportunity comes in from the standpoint of partnership whether it's it's public private partnership or government um, partnering with academia to see where it can um, improve itself. Um, we all know, especially, you know, and Maureen spoke to it, with the advent of AI, it seems as if everyone and anyone now is a, a cyber sleuth and, you know, they can up their game immediately. So it's, it's a constant ding dong fight. But that innovation for government can come in if government says, look, I will partner with the private sector to come up with innovative ways or I'll pop partner with academia to better understand how I can improve. And then it can roll out not only for government, but roll out for everyone else. So for me, that's how I see innovation playing a critical role in government cybersecurity. I'm not sure what Maureen and, and Jordan feel about that, but that definitely for me, it's a, it's a huge opportunity from a, a public private partnership perspective. Uh, I'll add a thought, and I'm sure Jordan has um, 
definitely a, a better qualitative talk, talk to give than I do, given his experience in the in the federal government here. But um, uh, you know, it, it's it's uh, a it's a very broad question, um, Ivy, and and I and you know we've we've been saying all along that uh, government is very concerned about cybersecurity. That no agency wants to be in the newspapers for the wrong reason for a mm -hmm. data breach, and yet they have it. Um, so uh, they do need to innovate. They, you know, my government customers that I speak to constantly recognize the need to innovate, um, but they are very concerned about implementing proper governance as part of innovation, adopting innovation. Um, there is no agency that will tell you that as part of adopting any technology innovation, uh, they are not going to adapt their risk management frameworks uh, or practices, uh, and that they're not going to implement governance over the adoption. You can't just implement a proof of concept for AI, for example, at an agency and deploy it to production and make it go live without a bunch of oversight and governance and uh, and consensus and, and training around it. So uh, training is another aspect, I think, that innovation offers. It's It's got a lot of, um, you know, what we're seeing in government cybersecurity is the need to increase uh, upskilling in cybersecurity, increase uh, training um, to have the ability for the government workforce to keep up uh, with uh, cybersecurity innovation and innovation in general. And uh, you will see that in government cybersecurity, workforce demands and workforce training demands are uh, exponentially increasing. So I think innovation is is creating a huge demand there. And I think uh, to sort of add on to what my fellow panelists have said, I, you know, I, I look at it this way: right? innovation in and of itself with, within government is central. There is a number of agencies that are doing innovative and creative things. If you even think about the compliance frameworks that we talked about, there's whole efforts that have been around and been working on to how do you actually automate that to using uh, um, uh, lines of code effectively to help run the compliance process in particular. I think ultimately where we may get stuck and one of the things I certainly used to talk about or be curious about prior to having worked in government uh, in particular was around, you know, hey, they're not necessarily adapting or adopting the innovative practice as quickly as I would want. Something has to give. Maybe they're not interested. The reality is, is that there is kind of this where they are today and they what they uh, what they need support with, what they're looking for partners to be working with them on is understanding the roadmap, the journey, if it will to adopt that more innovative concept in particular, right? It is not easy to say much to what has been talked about today, right? Uh, is about budgets and getting alignment and getting regulatory alignment and policy-wise, it's not easy to say, throw everything out and we're just gonna go do the new thing, right? You have to create, if you will, this more incremental approach to adopting the innovation and, right, and making sure that you're getting all the stakeholders involved. But it's essential to everything that the government has to do. It's the only reason in some cases um, that during the, you know, things like the height of the pandemic, they were able to shift completely to uh, remote work. It's because innovation had to be applied, right? It's one of the largest employers that had to basically take their entire workforce and tell them to go home, uh, right? And and still run the country on behalf of it, right? That's, a lot of that is attributed to the innovation that had to take place years prior, uh, many of which they were leading, if you will, what was being done even within the sector, Right. Um, and even some of the requirements we talk about today at MFA, they started in government and it's just gotten applied and maybe industry has surpassed today, but it started with them. So I think ultimately it's, it's you know, understanding that there may be uh, slow times, slow periods where, where it seems like they're not really innovating. It's really because they're trying to align the roadmap ultimately to execute. So, you know, for anyone working within the the, the, the government space, it's, it's just imperative to, to work with them on building kind of that vision and that long-term objective to be able to execute. Awesome. Well, thank you to everyone who submitted a question and thank you to our panelists for answering each of those questions on the fly. Um, I do have one final question for all three of our panelists. For someone who's just starting out in cybersecurity, what fundamental knowledge should they focus on acquiring? Jordan, go, 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 go ahead. You open your mic. No, I appreciate that. I, I would say fundamental knowledge. Uh, uh, one, it's it's really just continuing to embrace the appetite and hunger uh, for learning. 
Uh, and it's really because I, you know, I could say today, go look at X, Y, Z thing. I could say, go look at this document or this report or this trend as it relates to technology. The reality is, is that it's all going to change within the next, the next month, the next year, uh, et cetera. And so there's kind of, um, you know, thinking about it from the perspective of continual learning and continual development, and then understanding what it is to be able to quickly ingest uh, the information needed to, to kind of stay ahead. That's what I would recommend just broadly, because mm -hmm. again, the landscape for me, it's like, you know, David has continued to evolve so much uh, that it, it's, you know, it, it's hard to say pinpoint on one thing. It, it's instead, think of it from the perspective of, you know, how do I uh, ingest information? And then from there, uh, apply kind of that rigor to constantly trying to stay ahead uh, or, or up to date about what's going on. And that that's what I would offer here. I'll add a thought uh, to that is, um, you know, 27 years ago when I started my IT career out of college, I started as a programmer. I started as a C++ programmer. Um, that is not where you have to start um, for, you know, cybersecurity um, and to enter the cybersecurity profession. I interview, uh, you know, college uh, graduates all the time and, um, uh, you know, young consultants come up and ask, how do I get into the cybersecurity field? There is no prerequisite. Um, the prerequisite is interest, is curiosity. The track to start to train on is uh, sometimes is concentrate on a niche, like concentrate on a, on a swim lane. If you are interested in networking and uh, um, that is to say uh, IT network infrastructure, uh, and you can you can dive into network security and penetration testing um, and things like that. If you are if you have more of an engineering uh, bent uh, more of a, a you know a, a technology innovation and this I, AI thing really interests you and you don't know if you know what to do with it with cybersecurity understand the AI technologies and and train to understand the fundamentals of AI technology and then you will come into the security uh, thing naturally because uh, you'll understand what prompt injection means and things like that um, my recommendation to anyone wanting to start in cybersecurity is that um, start small and focus on a lane. Um, the rest will come and uh, you have to sort of organically uh, grow within a certain swim lane. The, the cybersecurity is an ocean. Yeah, you boil it, you know, the proverbial one bucket at a time, but but make sure you focus on a particular swim lane. Um, and the, the better you get, uh, the more you mature in the industry, uh, the more exposure you will have to other lanes. You know, 17 years ago, my entry into cybersecurity was in identity and access management. So Jordan, big ups to identity. Um, uh, and, and that's the lane I, I focused on that became, um, you know, a conversation through the years about how identity is the new perimeter in zero trust cybersecurity. Uh, that became a conversation into how do we enforce um, user access control? Um, that has become evolved into a conversation into what are the cyber risks I need to manage as we're adopting new uh, innovations and technologies like AI. Mm -hmm. So you will grow organically, but you will start small and you have to pick a focus somewhere. David? Um, I like Maureen's answer. It is extremely wholesome and, and expanded further on what Jordan had to say. The only thing that I'm going to add to both of them is at the end of the day, cybersecurity is about risk management. So you need to have an appreciation for what risk management is. Now, obviously, that is not something that's just going to come overnight. It comes over time, T. But as Maureen rightfully said, pick a swim lane and start to grow there. And then over time, you'll find that whatever skills you develop in that swim lane, they become transferable and you can take it over um, to the other side. And, and Maureen, you may have started on C++. I started on COBOL. So, um, yeah, we, yeah. Un we understand for, for programmers who then transition into cybersecurity, it just goes to show the skills are transferable. So yeah, that's where I'd start. Love it. Awesome. Thank you guys. Well, I certainly hope that everyone has taken away great insights on how to better navigate cyber frontiers and government contracting. I want to send a special thank you to David, Jordan, and Maureen for sharing their time and expertise with us. Um, for more information on future leadership connect events and webinars, head to the events tab on our website, or you can follow us on LinkedIn. That wraps today's session. I hope everyone has a great afternoon, and I thank you all for joining. Thank you, guys. Thank you.